we're live. So I will start by saying I miss Jack, who usually has been helping me with my Sunday lives, getting everything ready before the top of the hour. And man, I definitely miss him today as I go back to my old computer that needs updated and I'm just being stubborn about it. But um, after several tries now, I think we are officially uh, connected. Uh, there are some flaws, and that is I can't see your comments. <laughs> so uh, I was going to look at them on my phone and see if that doesn't screw things up. But I would love it if um, the folks could guess which skyline is behind me. I am not in Sioux Falls, which is why I'm missing Jack. <laughs> and uh, really do wish that um, I could have had... Uh, let's see here if I can see my own video <laughs> while... There we go. Oh, sweet. Okay, so I think I can see the live chat. So now I have at least a backup plan. So if you could guess where I'm at, that would be kind of fun. I just do want to say thank you for the forgiveness for not being perfectly on time there. And every every time I do this without help, I swear it's, it's a microphone that doesn't work or it's the uh, swirly rainbow that I get stuck in. But I have a great show for you tonight. I have some updates that I think have been plaguing our news and um, thank you for telling me that the sound is good because that's what took us so long and somebody already guessed it V Rose oh no not not San Antonio but close I am in Texas so oh, uh, PJB Burke you just got it <laughs> yes I am in Austin Texas that is the skyline in the back I'm just gonna lift it up because I think you can see the river down there uh, oops, there we go and unlike my hometown, there were quite a few sirens last night. And as much as I uh, have not had the stress, I guess, of seeing these uh, protests and riots and just unsettledness in our country, that uh, was unique <laughs> for me to see. Uh, quite a few uh, sirens and helicopters last night. and. I'm in Texas looking through uh, some opportunities of where I want to do my life next and checking with manufacturers and doing some other business things that I've really tried to uh, do by Zoom, but there are certain conversations you just need to have in person. So as we do every week, we're gonna start with some of my numbers. And for those of you that have been watching in the last week, uh, I'm just trying to get that, that light to be a little less harsh. Um, for those of you that have been watching in the last week, uh, I announced that Grandma Rose has been doing intermittent fasting at 76. Not because it's her first week on the ketogenic diet. Nope, she's been at it for five years. And her recent report from her chemo doctor is good in that the cancer isn't growing, but she does need to spark some autophagy on her, um, on, in, within her bone marrow. Her bone marrow is a place where she grows her red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets, and she had cancer of the white blood cells. That number is pretty stable thanks to her consistent ketogenic journey. But the number for her hemoglobin or her red blood cells and the number for her platelets keep shrinking down, which is a sign that the real estate inside her bone marrow is being uh, pushed around by some scar tissue. So there isn't a lot of things you can do for that, at, even at any age, but at 76. And um, we are going to do our best to use autophagy to really try and remodel some of that bone marrow. So she has been fasting to a Dr. Bob's ratio. I'm just going to show you. I'm starting out with my two uh, meters. There's a purple strip and a white strip. And you wait for that little blood drip to come on both of them. But uh, she is going to fast. So she has about 12 weeks between now and the next time she sees her oncologist. And she is going to fast for hopefully eight of those weeks to get to a Dr. Bob's ratio of 20 or less. And for those of you that are inside the Neurons page, which is a private Facebook page, you can see that she, there's our, our ketones counting down and just enough blood to get the glucose. She posted last week that she got you know, into the teens for about a day. So the ketones are 1.7 as I start and glucose is about 100. 
definitely because of the heat and the stress of what happened about 15 minutes before this show started. So we'll check that again at the end of the hour, um, but Grandma Rose is uh, really reaching for a good autophagy number because of her, um, her status over bone marrow. And if you want to follow her, she is going to try and post into that Neurons page. That Neurons page is a Facebook uh, page that is for the people who have completed that online course. Um, it just allows the folks who've really taken the ketogenic diet to a higher level um, and do a Dr. Paul's ratio and follow things like autophagy, which is not for everybody. But man, if you've got problems like Grandma Rose does, uh, they really do improve the output and the outcomes, and more importantly, she can measure them. So at 76, we both started fasting somewhere on Saturday last week, and by Monday afternoon, she hit um, pretty good numbers, but Tuesday was awesome numbers, and that's actually when we met with the oncologist to, sh to go over her data. Um, but once again, at Sunday afternoon, I started fasting with her yesterday, so I am about 36 hours into the fast, which is probably why my ketones are so high. I had every intention of drinking this during my fast, but I didn't bring any water at the last minute. So unless I get super thirsty, we're gonna we're gonna pause for that. So I was going to just look at the comments really quick, see if there's anything else that I should be aware of. Um, I do uh, really I'm really excited about the stuff we're gonna talk about tonight, and. Um, yeah, just looking, uh, several of you praising on Grandma Rose. Again, uh, for those of you new to the channel, she is my mom. She is the person that I wrote the book, Any Way You Can. And it, it has been an inspirational story uh, that I am I'm thankful for the outcome. She is, uh, at 71, did something very brave and started on a ketogenic diet in a way that was, um, didn't have nearly the awareness or support. She did it the advice of her daughter, me, internal medicine physician who said, this is what I'm going to use for protocols for repairing brains in my clinic. I still do that, but I have found a huge audience of people wanting to educate how can you use a state of ketosis to heal the human body or to really prevent uh, serious health problems. So, um, yeah, praise to Grandma Rose. We are going to talk tonight about, if you saw in the uh, um, podcast or in the um, thumbnail or in the show notes that tonight we're going to talk about something that's been in the news a lot. And I was looking back when the last time I talked about vitamin D um, and what it, how it correlates to the ketogenic diet. And that's probably been a year since I've done this conversation. So I thought, oh, it's a good time to refresh. I'm not going to go through a lot of the things I've gone through in the past, but um, I do think some people are really getting beat up for talking about ways to make the human body healthier. What is it as uh, I recommend to my patients that we really do dive in and talk about things that are seemingly unimportant like magnesium or zinc or uh, sleep or use of alcohol and one of those topics that is on a checklist and if you're following evidence-based medicine you're supposed to have this conversation with your physician but many times it gets pushed way down the the list and that's the conversation with um, what is your vitamin D level and how does that correlate to your health how does that correlate to uh, your overall improvement for um, not just a ketogenic diet just in general like your risk of cancer, prostate cancer, breast cancer, your risk of uh, heart disease, your risk of um, dementia, and all of those connections seem like how could that possibly connect to so many parts of the human body? Uh, but when you dive just a little bit into a vitamin D, it is clear this is not your average vitamin. This is more like a hormone or a pre-hormone is really what it is, but there isn't a cell or an organ system that doesn't connect with using vitamin D to signal, to grow, to suppress, and all of those um, messages dovetail into when they're working right, the patient is healthier. And we're gonna talk just a little bit more about that. 
vitamin D, I definitely have a sun because the sun is the most abundant source of vitamin D, uh, or at least it changes what goes on in the human body. So those sun rays come from the sun. You've got UVB radiation and UVA radiation. UVB radiation is the specific wavelength that takes this cholesterol-like uh, fat in the body and makes it an active, um, an active component uh, in the body known as vitamin D. That pre-hormone is, uh, again, signaling nearly every single patient, or <laughs> every single cell in the, in the body. Uh, vitamin D3 is what is active after your immune system, or after the sun takes that cholesterol and manipulates it just a little bit. Um, as, as you proceed to what happens next once the skin has been activated. Actually, I did it this way. There's two other ways that vitamin D get into the line of our system. One of them is supplements. Um, I can write ergocalciferol, vitamin D2. This really is uh, something as a prescription I could put in 50,000 uh, units pills and those supplements certainly do impact the way the blood levels turn out in patients. Um, Vitamin D3, however, the, the cholecalciferol, uh, is the part is the vitamin that's already been activated by the sunlight. So you can think of vitamin D2 still has to be uh, activated a little, uh, whereas vitamin D3 is ready for the next steps in the liver. So once you're in the liver, um, you have some enzymes that uh, take over and change the D3 into 25 hydroxy vitamin D. And when you come into the clinic and we check your vitamin D, this is what I'm measuring. I measure 25 hydroxy vitamin D. So those blood levels um, are important, but once the blood levels in the in the body are doing well, we have two ways. It hits the kidney. It is measured in the kidney, and the calcitrol is um, the actual active uh, uh, pre-hormone vitamin that will change uh, these signals on the cell membranes. So you look at um, that 125 dihydroxy vitamin D, it is the active form of vitamin D, it is a couple steps beyond vitamin D3. Um, your kidney could also do a couple other things with it. It could turn it into the water soluble form, which um, you would urinate out. So. There, that's what medical students get to know about vitamin D. Um, so there are four major sources of vitamin D and the UVB radiation or the sunlight is the most abundant. It is your major source. And I am totally guilty of spending the first 20 years of my practice chirping, chirping, chirping about vitamin D, or excuse me, about exposure to sun and the risk for skin cancer, never really taking time to spend uh, or to reflect on how many patients are getting skin cancer and when they get skin cancer how many of them can we not help i mean how many of them are deadly versus um how many of my patients completely stayed out of the sun because i either had them wear sunscreen or what i did to my kids is i had swimsuits that started at their wrists and went all the way to their ankles <laughs> yes they till, still make fun of me for that but completely covering up their skin not act not getting um, the, expecting the source of vitamin D to always be something that was supplemented or that they were eating and not use the major way our body makes vitamin D, which is the sun. Uh, so number one major source, number two, fatty fishes. Vitamin D comes from cod liver oil or mackerel, salmon. Uh, I'm a big fan of sardines and how they are cheap, easy, safe, and abundant. Um, and those do really have a huge source of vitamin D in them. Uh, the third place is that you can get food. The government has put fortification into to, to milk, to cereal, and to orange juice. And if you ever forgot which <laughs> foods were fortified, uh, all of the advertisers know this list by heart and they exploit that it is vitamin D fortified, vitamin D fortified. However, when you look at what the transition is from people who have vitamin D to those that are, that are taking vitamin D fortified foods and whether or not they still have a low uh, vitamin D, it's astonishing. It's like, yeah, it makes a measurable difference, but it's tiny, tiny, tiny. Um, and then finally, there are the supplements, which um, can come from my prescription. They can come from the, um, you know, the over-the-counter and the supplements 
uh, are also again measurable, but I would contend in the state that we're in, uh, decreasing or uh, increasing your chances of a low vitamin D by having multiple sources of this is going to be your best bet. All right, so a couple of the studies that have come out, uh, or actually this was another thing that I wanted to point out. When you're looking at vitamin D uh, and where uh, people tend to be low, if you look at population studies, but if you look at who tends to be low and what kinds of things really do impact the increase of vitamin D, um, you're going to look on the polar sides of 35 degrees latitude if you live north of uh, 35 degrees in the northern hemisphere or south of 35 degree latitude in the southern hemisphere, your vitamin D is going to be lower statistically. Um, seasons tend to make a big difference. If you live in a city where you don't go outside for four or five months, those seasons really do decrease vitamin D. And, and like many of these uh, vital nutrients, um, most of the population lives right on the edge or deficient. And as soon as they drop it for a few months, their brain slows down, their energy slows down, and their immune system slows down. Um, time of day from 10 to 2, no, your, your vitamin D doesn't go up from 10 to 2, but that exposure to sunlight between 10 and 2, uh, that is when those vitamin, those UVB rays are the best. And having exposure to that sunlight is super important. When you are in a rainy world, they always pick on poor Seattle for this, but it is true the people in Seattle have a much lower vitamin D. Of course, they live north of the 35 degree latitude, but they also have uh, weather that keeps them inside quite a lot. Um, as you age, it is harder to synthesize cholesterol. Uh, you know, this evil word that we've all learned to hate uh, or at least fear that it's going to have uh, an association with a heart attack, but really, you you need cholesterol to make this vitamin to convert uh, your vitamin D, and that really is a predictor of health. And then finally, skin pigmentation. I, I mentioned earlier that vitamin D2 will be converted into D3 in the skin. Uh, that UVB rate needs to hit vitamin D2 to, to turn it into vitamin D3, and if you have melanin, uh, excessive melanin, or the more melanin you have, the more it blocks that transition, so they are, as a population, lower on uh, vitamin D in their blood. And those are turning out to be really important. So I wanted to point out here, here's just a, the latitudes, where do you live? You can see, um, hopefully find your state here, but we're going to really focus in that we want 35 on either side of that. So as you look at the globe, what is 35, um, 35 degrees in... Uh, the latitudes on either side of the equator, I think it's amazing to see how much of uh, the United States is north of that. You know, it really is. I'm obviously not there right now. I'm totally south of that 35th uh, latitude line. But South Dakota, we are there. We are there all year long and all <laughs> forever and ever. But it really does make a difference when you look at the, um, the health issues that are associated with a low vitamin D. All right, uh, so what are those health issues? What are some of the things that we have learned over the last, um, I mean, they've always, some of these have always been around, but um, a few of these I like to really just take a minute and let you sink in. Some of these have been in the headlines this past week, but especially over the last four months, there's been a lot of attention on, um, again, some of the checklists that a perfect physician's visit would be covering, but many times we are putting out a crisis and getting to these deeper layers of your health prevention or what seem like little issues. Ah, it's vitamin D. They can get it over the counter. I don't need to cover that. But the value and importance of vitamin D have never been <laughs> more of a headline than they have this past week where they were looking at how the immune function uh, through specific cells called dendritic cells as well as T cells. And if you remember back into my gut lecture, I talked a lot about the dendritic cells. I've, I've talked a lot about T cells and how important they are for fighting infection. Um, we know that a vi vitamin D is correlated to the clearance of viruses. Uh, many of the studies have been done on influenza, but in the last six months with the COVID eruption, uh, vitamin D correlation to the viral clearance of um, COVID seemed to have a higher correlation. Uh, and again, they're small studies. You can't uh, get you know, mixed up with causation and correlation, but man, this is an easy thing to fix. This is cheap. It's really hard to overdo vitamin D, uh, and especially it's going to take you a 
good nine months of excessive supplementation to get too much vitamin D. Um, it also is associated with a reduced inflammatory response. Uh, you look at vitamin D and it really does settle down some of those vacuoles that are filled with cytokines. Cytokines, you might recall that word, I've covered it a few times on the show, that cytokines are linked to that cytokine storm where if the virus gets into the lungs and the cytokines get twitchy and start to vibrate, they uh, secrete all of their enzymes which results in a flood of inflammation and fluid in the lungs so that's called that's drowning <laughs> that's not that's where ventilators and stuff become really important but even the ventilators don't seem to have the reversal of um, the cytokines uh, once they've emptied into the circulation for heaven forbids emptied into the area of the lungs um, so again vitamin D correlates with a lower level of interleukin 6 interleukin 6 low interleukin 6 correlates to a high risk for uh, cytokine storm, uh, that same process I just went through. And vitamin T, D affects the metabolism of zinc. We've heard a lot about zinc. Um, uh, we've also heard a lot about uh, copper. And I think I heard one, one uh, caveat about silver, but specifically copper and zinc, I really, uh, those have very easy to follow pathology or, um, you know, uh, pathophysiology to connecting to vitamin D. And that metabolism of zinc, the use of zinc to protect us from infections, specifically viral infections, it's very easy to process that. But if the vitamin D is missing, that zinc can't do its job. So when people say, oh, you know, you have a cold, take in zinc. And sure enough, you can absorb zinc. But if you're trying to activate it and your vitamin D is low, um, party foul, that's not going to work out for you. And when I look at, um, let's see if I got it. Oh yeah, so there's a few more. So there are several, one of the tests that, or one of the, you'll see this in the show notes if you wanna take a closer look, that one of the articles I put um, there was the one where it's saying, <laughs> what's sad to me is they called a vitamin D of 20 or less was what they called deficient. But in my practice, I tell people it, it needs to be 50. 50 is a uh, predictor where I can start to say you are ha you have a le decreased risk of breast cancer, a decreased risk of prostate cancer, your risk of a heart attack is less, your rich of risk of dementia is less. The the number of health value um, predictors, the you know the risk of those health problems that are chronic and long, and you're going to become friends with the internist. Uh, they are correlated to a much lower incidence when the vitamin D is not just out of danger zone, it's healthy, it's above 50. Um, that's not easy to do. <clears throat> so <clears throat> when I look at, we know that, <clears throat> oh, that was the promote clearance, I already did that. Oh, I did this one too. So the only thing I cared about that was to get through the 20 milligrams or uh, nanograms per milliliter. Um, and I just want to remind people that cytokines are these really goofy proteins, interleukin-4, interleukin-5, interleukin-6, 10, 13, and they are supposed to be quiet, and then when it's time for them uh, to flare, uh, they need to go up and they need to come back down. When those uh, cytokines, so that's what all those little, that wave was for, is when they go up and they come back down, you fight what your cytokine was triggered for. Um, unfortunately, when, <clears throat> when you look at the um, cytokines that uh, jiggle, they just get stimulated and then they get jiggly and the next guy gets jiggly and the next guy gets jiggly, uh, they start releasing all these cytokines and that's what a cytokine storm is, is that in, in the use of vitamin D, that process is regulated. It doesn't flare for hours on end. So looking at... Um, the places where um, it's not regulated very well in diabetes, when you're overweight, when you have depression or anxiety, when you have an autoimmune problem, when you're, you have cancer, in elderly, in sleep disorders, in smokers, in vaping, in alcohol uh, use. All of these are places where we know the cytokines overshoot. And these are all populations that have uh, an increased um, mor mor morbidity, meaning they struggle more when getting... Uh, COVID-19. 
The other one to add to that is people with low vitamin D. Explaining uh, vitamin D isn't uh, just the splash in the pan. There are so many sublayers to uh, how important the, the hormone is. And I call it a hormone, not a vitamin, because it, it really is a signaling pathway for so many of the cells within our body that as I look at some of the things that I follow very closely in my patients, but let's talk about the patients I really care about. I mean, I care about all of them, but I really care about my mom and looking at her vitamin D and um, my dad actually just uh, passed away about eight weeks ago now from kidney failure. And if you go back in his medical chart over the last uh, nine years uh, as the first documented low vitamin D that he had, uh, it's about the time where this strange protein started to be leaking out his body and we didn't know why. All the tests in the world were done and they never did find what is the cause of that, um, that protein. But one thing was true is, and that is his vitamin D was awful. Like I, um, at one point his uh, vitamin D was in the teens, like 15. And he is the six foot two muscular farmer who Although he spends time in the sun, his uh, long sleeve shirts and long sleeve pants were the, that's his uniform for the farm. So he didn't have, a, he was so white, it was awful. Uh, so as we uh, tried to crack the code on getting his vitamin D up, the more I learned about this, the more I said, Dad, we really need to, to fix this. Uh, we're spending all this energy on increasing your blood count with Procrit and um, we've got you on a ketogenic diet. Uh, there, there's... There, but this vitamin D is so low, it, it's, it's blocking the effect of what all these other health processes are doing. At the same time as mom's uh, vitamin D was, you know, in the mid-20s, which again, very low. Um, supplementing her got her into the 30s, but we didn't, we didn't cross 50 until she went on a ketogenic diet. Part of that ketogenic process was her gut practiced absorbing fat. So fat, uh, you have vitamin D, E, A, and K are your fat soluble vitamins. They are fat that if, you, if you're one of those people who says, I can't be on the ketogenic diet, every time I eat that much fat, I end up in the toilet, I have terrible loose stools, um, that's a sign that you're not absorbing fat very well. But I would contend that most people with diabetes, most people with insulin resistance, most people who have been overweight, they struggle, if you get down to the cellular level, they struggle to absorb the fat. But once the vitamin, the fat vitamin is absorbed, there are still other steps that need to be done. So like if you take in vitamin D2, which is what I was giving my dad, um, you know, 50,000 units, I wasn't, but his physician was 50,000 units. Um, I think it was, so you, you write the prescription usually for a three month trial. So it's 12 weeks, one pill a week. And I think he had, he took it for a year uh, and we couldn't get that vitamin D out of the twenties to save his life. Uh, at which point I said, all right, dad, we're going to do this differently. So I was asking my dad, uh, to, um, take this, um, take this, uh, vitamin, uh, that his body didn't do a very good job of, of um, absorbing and now I was trying to get him to uh, get a higher number uh, not just based on his um, lab but just I, I couldn't believe we could put that much energy into replacing his oral vitamin D and again he lives way above that 35th uh, latitude his his uh, nickname was always chicken legs because he had such white legs I swear there was zero melanin in every single one of his cells but as I um, really slowed down and said, all right, how in the world could I possibly do a better job of helping him um, with his, um, uh -oh. that's not what I meant to do. How could I do a better job of a asking him to absorb vit the vitamin D? And um, here were some of the mistakes he was doing. So I would tell him, you don't need to be out in the sun long, Dad. Just sit out on the, on the front porch and, from 10 to 2, and you will, um, you'll, you'll absorb enough vitamin D uh, through those UVB rays in just 10 minutes. But um, there were several things that he had that uh, this list, we're going to come back up to that. But I want to show you um, this picture. I love this one. Vitamin D for seniors. Okay, that was my dad, right? So he was a senior. 
And when you look at what his uh, midday would have been, it's how many minutes in midday sun, summer sun are needed for adequate vitamin D. Let's go to San Diego. Um, and if you were a youth, <laughs> uh, notice that t if you just have your hands and feet, it's only 12% of your skin that's exposed, or excuse me, your hands and face, it's only 12% of your skin that's exposed. So even kids needed 42 minutes in the sun uh, to get about 40 nanograms per milliliter a day. Um, as you got a little higher on that list, uh, short sleeves, you took the it from 42 minutes down to 19 minutes. And again, the purpose of this uh, slide is showing you, hey, guess what? You're out from 10 to 2. Your doctor, like I have done, has said, hey, if you just get 10 minutes of this, you're going to be fine. 10 minutes of sunlight. But the problem was that what with that is um, other medical conditions needed to be right for that to be true. Uh, so here are, um, if they had shorts and a t-shirt, now you have 46% of the skin exposed and you needed 11 minutes. Um, if you get to the adults, um, now he need. Uh, actually it's not adults, it's um, the, this is still the youth for San Diego needed seven minutes if all they wore were shorts and, and shoes. Uh, if you go to Seattle though, look at that, you needed 168 minutes um, in that, um, in the sun if you only were going to have your hands and face exposed. So people who say, I took my lunch hour outside, I'm getting my vitamin D, I need you to expose your skin. Um, and of course, if you're a senior, the number of minutes it takes when you're in shorts is higher than the youth needed when they only had their face and hands exposed in San Diego. So you look at some of the other uh, things that this excluded. This chart did not take into case, they use the word obese, but when you look at the studies, they're really talking about um, in, insulin resistance. Anybody whose Dr. Boss ratio hangs out above 100 forever and ever, uh, that process of absorbing vitamin D much slower. Um, of course, dark skin, that melanin prevents that vitamin D2 to go to vitamin D3. Um, and as, uh, I mean, you look, it's almost twice as many minutes for the obese, twice as many minutes if they have black skin or the darker the melanin, or excuse me, five times uh, as many minutes if they have the darkest melanin. Um, early morning or late afternoon, twice as many minutes. Um, and then season, um, if it's during the spring or fall and you're up in South Dakota, <laughs> if you have an urban haze, that blocks it out too, and light clouds block it as well. So I like to go back to this and say, all right, so five to 10 minutes is only if you were near the equator and you were young and you were not obese and you had light skin and it's in the summer and it's in the middle of the day and you have lots of skin exposed to the sun and you're lying down and you're not wearing any sunscreen and you have a healthy liver. What they're really trying to talk about there is insulin resistance, but uh, no clouds, no air pollution. You have um, a good response to sunshine, uh, four times the variation of individuals. Uh, this chart also, and I will link this uh, website down below, I just think it's a fun one for you to, uh, it's called vitamindwiki.com and I just think they've taken the data and put it um, pretty, pretty succinct. Um, and looking at, you know, it's almost three hours in the sun if you're obese, elderly, or have dark skin. Uh, we know that the um, correlation to vitamin D and the response to COVID D uh, COVID uh, D19 is, it's actually impressive. I, I'm very uh, curious to see where um, the, the data will go over the next, um, I would say, um, you're going to see plenty of people studying this. Um, so for those of you that have ever listened to Radiolab, Radiolab has uh, just a, it's, it's a podcast that it tells pretty good stories using science. And um, I had heard part of this, part of their documentary, the same story, and not exactly the same one, uh, but that when they were studying homeless people uh, for COVID-19, uh, they were measuring lots of the homeless and they were not finding positives. And, you know, there was some conspiracy, oh, are the kits, are they just the good kits or are they getting, getting uh, poor quality kits? Um, is it uh, a, the process of, um, you know, their immune system is stronger or something. I mean, there were several theories that turned out to be a little wacky, uh, but the data persisted. And um, as you look at the correlation between um, 
not only were the uh, homeless people, I think the first study was done on the East Coast, and then they said, well, maybe it's just that population. So then they were looking at homeless from, um, from San Francisco and LA, and so now you got both coasts, and pretty universal that they, were ha they had such a striking lower number of positive cases per, per number tested. Um, and the vitamin D data came out, and you'll hear them talk about this on Radiolab if you want to hear them. I don't agree with all the conclusions they came up with because uh, the CDC specialist said, yeah, in general, uh, homeless people have uh, a lower vitamin D, they're malnourished. But it wasn't the same population that they were checking the COVID D tests in that was linking to the vitamin D. These were different populations of homeless that, that she was talking about. She was generalizing the populations of the homeless and saying, yeah, but usually homeless have low vitamin D. I mean, we all usually have low vitamin D, but it, I think it was powerful that the people that were getting infected, I mean, excuse me, the people that were uh, being checked for infections for COVID-19 uh, that were homeless had such a strikingly lower rate of infection and they still, they didn't have symptoms, like their symptom profile was way less. So it brings me back to, what do I tell my kids to do? What do you do if you're in my house? And, um, you know, vitamin D supplementation isn't um, something I was always very good about. Uh, I, I just assumed my kids were getting enough. But you can't live in my house now if, unless you're taking a supplement of vitamin D. Hold on here. But I don't put uh, anything on the market that I don't have my kids and I take together. Uh, and my, I specifically made this when my dad was strugg struggling with his kidney problems. And these are two of the fat soluble uh, vitamins that I really um, almost feel embarrassed that for 20 years of my medical practice, I didn't, uh, I wasn't as methodical about this as I was checking blood pressure and cholesterol and diabetes. Uh, meaning I, I wasn't doing what could be done to prevent things I was using um, the diagnostic test to find problems instead of stop them. But uh, vitamin, D, vitamin D2, uh, K2, D3 is one of the only vitamins that I probably will ever sell. But it is because when the ketogenic diet starts to work, uh, when they're finally able to absorb fat, which is usually after they become keto adapted, the rate at which they can absorb the activated uh, uh, vitamin is it's impressive and the improvement in their mental health and their energy and their metabolic processes are, um, are really in line. As I look at uh, what I did do with my dad is I put him, instead of giving him v D2, which still needs sunlight to become D3, I put him on D3. I put K2 with it because that does improve the absorption. I made sure he was taking magnesium because that also improves how vitamin D works. But then I sent him, he lives in a town of about 800 people, so I called the local beauty shop who happens to have a tanning bed. And I asked the lady there, can you look to see if your tanning bed has UVB bulbs in it? So you can have tanning beds that have UVA and UVB bulbs or a combination. Most of them have a combination, but you have to check. And it is against the law in South Dakota, it's against the law in most states, for any of the tanning bed people to say or to promote or to advertise that the UVB ray, UVB bulbs increase vitamin D. Because of the fear of, of skin cancer, they could not say that. It's illegal to do that. But for educational purposes, you should know that that is one of the ways that if you live in South Dakota and you're a farmer and you have uh, your, your wrist to your ankles filled <laughs> with the clothes that come with your job and every other farmer means you're in uniform. You have long sleeves and long pants on. You're considered silly if you wear shorts, especially most months of the year. So I said, Dad, I need you to go up to the tanning bed and I need you to lay in there for four minutes, butt naked. <laughs> My dad loved this. He was like, I've never been to a tanning bed. I, I want to go to a tanning bed. I said, Dad, I cannot seem to get your vitamin D up. We are going to hack this. We're going to do this other ways. So I said, I don't want you to burn, so we're going to put you in the tanning bed for four minutes twice a week, but we're going to have all of your skin exposed. And as we exposed his skin twice a week, um, what happened at first is a very common thing that I observe with many of my patients is that when I ask them to get sunlight, the first, the first time they're exposed to sunlight, they burn. Uh, and 
I mean, I, I warn them, you can only be out for a few minutes. You can only be out for a few minutes. And they'll say, Doc, I was really only out for like five minutes. And I still got a sunburn. And I, 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 this is totally anecdotal, but this happened to my dad as well, that the first exposure, four minutes in that bed, and he still got burned. Now, it was just a light burn, but still it was enough where we don't want you getting burned. That's a bad, <laughs> that's like the, the opposite of helping you. We want you um, increasing and converting that vitamin D2 to vitamin D3. And the number of skin cells exposed to UVB rays is what mattered. So as I look at people saying, yes, taking a supplement will help you. Use D3 because it doesn't require the sunlight to do that last little part of the activation. Take it with K2. I can go through that a different day that it does help in the delivery model or in the activation and how it's used. Make sure you're not low on magnesium. That's another very important process. <clears throat> the, other, um, the other hack, though, is ask the tanning bed near you if you have UVB bulbs. Because I took, again, I'd been at this for a decade, and after his death, I went back and looked at some of the medical records just to kind of, like, you know, slow down and say, what if? Um, but his uh, vitamin D, I mean, it was, it was in the teens for a long time. And you can tell where we supplemented because he got up into the 20s. And that's still not good. I mean, again, in my clinic, I want my patients above 50. That is what protects you. And this is an easy test to check. I mean, it's not super easy, but it's easy enough. I mean, a blood test, and it's pretty reliable. Um, we're checking after the... D2 got absorbed, got it through the cut lining, it's fat, remember? And then the sun turned it into D3, uh, and then your liver activated it a little oil, and then your kidney further activated it. And of course, my dad's um, problem was he, um, he, his kidneys were in big trouble, so his vitamin D became really important at the end of his life. So I think it took us six weeks for him to get, you know, first couple of weeks he could go in for four minutes and I said as soon as you stop having this red reaction when you're in the tanning bed meaning that little burn we can increase the minutes but we're not gonna go past four minutes in the tanning bed and my cute little father said it takes me longer to get the clothes on and off than I lay in the bed <laughs> it was all irritable but he kept doing it God bless him and uh, so then about three weeks in I said okay if you're not burning anywhere let's try to go up to you know, six minutes or seven minutes and by about the fifth week, he could lay in there for 10 minutes. And then I said, if you get up to 10 minutes, let's just do it once a week. Because he was definitely crabby about going into the tanning bed with all the ladies there getting their hair done. So uh, it was on the 12th week that um, we checked his vitamin D. And it was 80, <laughs> which is like unheard of. I'm like, do you think the lab messed up his blood? <laughs> The next time we checked it, it was 60, but the doctor who actually that ordered it, it was just on his profile to be checked, said, I think you're, you're becoming toxic in vitamin D. It's been in the 20s forever, and now it's 80. But if you look back at when he felt the best, it was when his vitamin D was north of 50. And that process that we've all, if you haven't seen this in the news, um, you know, listen to the link below for Radio Lab. It's a really good storytelling. I disagree with some of the conclusions at the end. I really think that vitamin D is an easy, safe, cheap, effective process for increasing your immune system and how it functions. And I don't, I don't um, have a lot of, maybe I do have a lot of rules for my kids, but one of the rules, if you're in my house, you gotta be taking vitamin D. This is one of those uh, supplements that I, we live north of that 35 uh, degrees latitude we wear long pants and long sleeves a lot of the days of the year and uh, the correlation to immune systems and brain function uh, can't be, um, I mean, we can spend some more time trying to connect the dots, but I'm pretty convinced that it's not going to hurt you. Uh, it's going to be a long time of taking vitamin D before you're deficient, or, I mean, before you're toxic. Uh, and the deficiency is in so many people that I would err on the side of taking the supplement and getting it checked. And if you live north of 35 degrees, uh, you can see what I did with my dad and make your own decisions. All right. So the end of the day, end of the um, end of the uh, show, I try to do some um, <laughs> um, 
so I did, did somebody did just text in I was just looking at some of the messages that uh, when vitamin his vitamin D was a hundred and sixty if you look at the parameters for vitamin D uh, toxic levels are considered to be above a hundred uh, it is fat soluble so uh, once you get it replaced it doesn't take nearly as much like with my dad he could I don't think he was absorbing it for the longest time uh, and finally when we caught up it took a lot less effort to keep it up than it did to get it up and that um, you know the biggest step one was I put him on this uh, he actually took four tablets of that every day and I think it was about um, you know, he, he had taken the prescription strength for a while but between the prescription strength and the um, it had already run out so the, the doctor was like well we just did that let's see how your levels are and we did the tanning bed all right so we're gonna check my numbers again again I've got a purple strip in for this one and a white strip in for this one and there's that one coming down that's the glucose and ketones so ketones are about the same glucose is much better again I was pretty stressed at the beginning of this to look at um, my microphone not working and several other things being late. I don't like that. Um, but uh, again, each week I try to show you that I don't just ask people to check their Dr. Boz ratio. I really do check it in myself. Um, for those of you that are in the neurons page, uh, I would uh, just have you keep an eye on Grandma Rose on how she's doing. Her goal is to fast every week. Uh, and again, if you're new to the ketogenic diet, please do not step into intermittent fasting until you've crossed over that threshold I talk about. Um, I've done that on enough channels. I won't repeat that tonight. But um, fasting too quickly is one of the biggest mistakes I see in people with chronic inflammatory problems or chronic illness is they push their, their endocrine system to do something it's not in shape for. Uh, being on the ketogenic diet will make your body in shape. You will be able to absorb uh, fat-based molecules, including vitamin D and vitamin K uh, and E, uh, you'll absorb them more efficiently, but you also have an endocrine system that works more efficiently as well, not overshooting when it needs, uh, not, not wiggling your way into a cytokine storm, but instead a very connected process of stress and response. When it comes to vitamin D, I haven't spoken about this for a year. Uh, and I really do think that um, it is one of those things you can take into your own hands and really um, assess on your own. Uh, there's blood tests that you can ask your doctor for, but most places now, if you have insurance, you can walk into your provi provider and just say, I want a lab test, and most places honor that now. Um, in addition, vitamin D is uh, related to the sun. So use your sun. If you're in the northern hemisphere, don't forget that you have some UVB bulbs that can help you as well. All right, well, I appreciate all of you that uh, waited for me, even though I was a little tardy. We are after the hour, and um, I will uh, be checking your comments here as I sign off, but I will call it a night. And for those of you in San, excuse me, I'm not in San Antonio. For those of you in Austin, this is, which is where I'm from, I'm at, I don't know if you can see that skyline. Uh, okay, it's a little tippy there. Um, I would love to hear the, hear from you. I am looking for um, just I've never been to this uh, part of the universe uh, outside of a few plane trips um, and I'm checking it out. All right we'll catch you later. I am Dr. Boz signing off.